All right, so Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum everyone. My name is Maria Tari and I'm a resident of Radiation Oncology. Today's meeting will be um, moderated by Dr. Aisha Iqbal, uh, who is from Inmol, Can Inmol Cancer Hospital. She's a resident of Radiation Oncology there. Our session facilitator for the today is Dr. Sadia Sadiq, who is a consultant radiation oncologist at Inmol Cancer Hospital. She's also Jeevan's GU pod coordinator. While our expert panelist for today's session is Dr. Nadeem Parvez, who is a vice president of Mestro and consultant radiation oncologist in Sultan Kabu's comprehensive cancer care uh, hospital in Oman. He is the G1 GU pod lead for the region. So before we begin this session, I would like to thank uh, today's um, moderator, Dr. Aisha Iqbal, who has kindly agreed to prepare uh, today's session and Dr. Sadia Sadiq for facilitating her throughout the process. And uh, my uh, gratitude uh, to Dr. Nadeem Parvez as well, who has kindly agreed to um, join us today as, as an expert. So before we begin, I would like to invite Dr. Bilal Ahmed for tilawat e quran Just if, you, if anyone can confirm if I'm audible. Yes, you are, Dr. Maria. Thank you so much. Dr. Bilal, please start. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اقرأ بسم ربك الذي خلق خلق الإنسان من علق اقرأ وربك الأكرم الذي علم بالقلم علم الإنسان ما لم يعلم Translation O Prophet in the name of your Lord who created created human from a clinging clot read and your God is most generous who taught by the pen taught humanity what they knew not Dr. Bilal. Now we'll move towards our national anthem. participants who have just joined. Today is the sixth session of the Kipro series. This session is going to be on muscle invasive bladder cancer. Dr. Aisha, who is a resident of radiation oncology from Inmol, 
uh, collated all the learning objectives and prepared the presentation material for today's session. So many thanks to Dr. Aisha and Dr. Sadia Sadiq for facilitating her in this process. Dr. Nadeem Parvez is our today's expert panelist. Uh, in the interest of time, I, may I re please request Dr. Aisha to share her screen and start with the presentation. And I would welcome all the participants. Uh, you can drop your questions in the chat box. Assalamu alaikum, I'm Dr. Aisha from Mood Cancer Hospital. I'm going to share my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Dr. Uh, Maria? No. Uh, no, I cannot. Is it visible now? Ibad and Javiria, can you please confirm? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, it could be better if we share the whole screen rather than the PowerPoint. Yeah, thank you. It's visible now. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. So let's start with the today's session. Okay, so today our topic is muscle invasive bladder cancer, as Dr. Maria has told. So let's start with the introduction. Uh, I will give the brief introduction, then uh, we will discuss the case scenario. So approximately 30% of newly diagnosed bladder cancers have muscle invasion. Besides 20 to 25% of superficial bladder cancers progress to muscle invasive bladder cancer sometime during their natural history. And approximately 30% of patients diagnosed with muscle invasive bladder cancer have undetected metastasis at the time of treatment. And the optimal goals of our treatment is long-term survival, prevention of pelvic recurrence or development of metastatic bladder cancer, and an excellent quality of life. And we all know that it includes stage two to up to four A. So, if we uh, look at the anatomy of the bladder, so bladder is described as having an apex, a superior surface, uh, in prolateral surfaces, base or the posterior surface, a trigon and neck. So risk factors uh, include the genetic risk factors uh, and old, in older age, it is more common. Uh, and the individuals having the GSTM1 and the slow acetylation, uh, it has the higher uh, risk of developing bladder cancer. Uh, and it also includes environmental risk factors. Strong, most strongest risk factor among them is tobacco smoking, also including passive exposure. Other than that, there are occupational hazards and uh, there are certain drugs which cause uh, bladder cancer, ionizing radiations and chronic infections or inflammation in which uh, schistosomiasis is uh, associated with the squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. So what is the clinical presentation of the patient uh, who is later diagnosed as CA bladder is mostly painless hematuria, macro or microscopic urinary frequency due to irritation and reduced capacity of the bladder, uh, obstructive symptoms, which include upper UTI or urinary tract obstruction or lower tract obstruction, lower abdominal pain, or symptoms due to invasion of the surrounding structures or any metastatic region. And histopathology, uh, it includes transitional cell carcinoma, which is most common, uh, and it uh, around 90% commonly contain components of SCC, adenocarcinoma, small cell, or sarcomatoid elements. Other than that, squamous cell carcinoma, which is around 5%, small cell, adenocarcinoma, and other mixed variants. So I will not go into the detail of the staging uh, because we all know that. Uh, briefly, we all know that uh, non-invasive uh, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and muscle invasive bladder cancer. So in non-muscle invasive, it will be T A, T S, and T one. So uh, from T two up to T four A, it will be included in the muscle invasive bladder cancer. So let's start with our case scenario. 
uh, a patient XYZ, age 65 years old, male, presented with some pain of hematuria for six months, followed by pelvic pain and obstructive symptoms. Uh, on your analysis, uh, there was hematuria. And uh, I would like to discuss this point here uh, that can the type of RBCs in urine give clue if the hematuria is from upper or lower urinary tract? Uh, so, Dr. Sadia, please elaborate this. Uh, actually, uh, hematuria is RBCs in urine. And uh, RBCs are uh, sometimes uh, associated with certain clots. If the clots are circular, they are more uh, point towards the bladder region. And if the clots are uh, thread like stranded, they point to that they can be upper tract involved. So, uh, and also if there are dysmorphic RBCs, they give a hint about uh, any glomerular uh, uh, pathology. So, uh, sir, sir, please, Dr. Nadim, if you can uh, further elaborate. Sorry, can you please repeat again? Uh, uh, actually, sir, RBCs are uh, associated with clots, and if the clots are circular, it points toward that the uh, hematuria can be of bladder, urinary bladder origin. And if the clots are stranded or thread like, they give us some hint about that the origin is from the upper urinary tract. And uh, if the RBCs are dysmorphic, then uh, they uh, depict that uh, there is some glomerular pathology. But this is what I have um, found. Okay, that's a good information for me too. Actually, I'm not uh, much aware of that, that difference because the maturia is only guide us to investigate further for that, whether this is a, a suspected bladder cancer or not. And after the cystoscopy and diagnosis, those patients reach to us. So I think this information more helpful to the urologist before they establish the, the diagnosis. Uh, and sir, uh, what, is there any additional uh, uh, information we get uh, of urinary cytology at this stage with the patient presenting hematuria? <clears throat> yeah. So what we're looking for is that in cytology, if there are malignant cells, and if they find some uh, microscopy, if they can find malignant cell, and then investigate further again, then with the biopsy. So that would be more relevant to us. But I think the urologist is the one who established diagnosis before us. So they have, uh, they actually go through all this information. Actually also there are certain urine tests for tumor markers. I uh, read on the internet, they are not available here. But uh, yeah. I would like yeah. to ask you, if, are there any tumor markers available on urine test? Uh, for the, yeah, not, not very clear that we'll be able to distinguish or differentiate at the moment, but there are uh, markers which are under investigation. And also there are, um, you know, there are other molecular markers we are looking into and lots of them um, are under investigation, but nothing established at the moment. And we are, they are trying to, there are studies where they're trying to establish the role of those markers to decide the type of treatment as well in future. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, the, then, uh, the next investigation of choice uh, would be uh, ultrasound KUB uh, or check cystoscopy can also be done. Uh, so Dr. Sadia, what would you prefer? Well, as sir has mentioned, most of the patients, they present to urologist and for hematuria, they have one or two courses of antibiotics, and if it is not settled, then they move on to uh, investigations like uh, ultrasound of kidney urinary bladder or an office cystoscopy as per urologist choice. But one point I want to highlight is that uh, before any imaging, uh, other further imaging like cross sectional imaging, uh, the, the urologist or the doctor should not go straight up to PURBD. Before the transverse reception of the uh, bladder tumor or before uh, resection, imaging cross sectional imaging, preferably with a CT scan, is the very most important thing to do. CT mm -hmm. Okay. So after that, we will do uh, imaging uh, before. Uh, sorry, sorry. Yes, sorry, sir. Dr. Aisha, I'm really sorry, I am interrupting you. Don't, there is a raised hand. Okay. Uh, okay. What is yeah. the question? As Assalamu alaikum. In fact, I am so happy today. Uh, you know what point I was about to raise uh, at the previous slide? Uh, my colleague, Dr. Sadia Sadik, has raised it in this slide. I'm really surprised and overwhelmed and very happy that, mashallah, our mentees are getting so mature and so exclusive. Uh, may, I, I was uh, uh, just thinking, Dr. Nadeem Parvez, to raise this point 
uh, that because we represent fraternity of oncologists. We have we are oncologists, so we have the ownership of cancer. Urologist does not have a ownership of cancer. You know, he's a territorial surgeon. We respect him, but he's only a part of the MDT tumor board. So, Alhamdulillah, what I was just about to speak out. Uh, thank you for giving me a fraction of a second. And Sa Dr. Sadia Sadik came as a second slide. This slide is very important, and I really congratulate Dr. Aisha as well for showing the first slide. That is the Pakistani scenarios, what she has shown. So, we have to insist people to go for imaging sooner rather than later. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So, uh, the imaging modality does, uh, which imaging modality should be used? Ideally, it should be a CT scan. If the patient yes. is able to... Uh, so I, uh, I stop here. I stop uh, here. But uh, that was the point I was trying to make, that imaging, we have to go straight away. And we insist our urologists that they don't go for this and that and all this differential diagnosis. But straight, they have to diagnose cancer so that we can start treatment early because yeah. the percentage you are showing uh, rightly so is in the book, but we are seeing more advanced cancers. So that is why imaging is the first thing before they start disturbing things with TURBT or doing other all sort of damages, you know. So thank you for raising this point. So I stop here. Thank you. Thanks, sir, for adding an important point. Well, for imaging, uh, CT uh, urogram is done. That is for cross-sectional imaging of kidney, ureters, and bladder as a whole. This particular protocol is used uh, it is actually CT with and without contrast and a delayed arterial phase, a normal photovenous phase, and a delayed venous phase in which the contrast is in the urinary bladder is usually used by the radiologist uh, and then the uh, CT urography is done. Yes, that is called as urographin phase, the third phase. It is used to see the anatomy of the bladder. And uh, after that, we will uh, advise further test. Uh, and uh, one question is that, uh, is there a need of MRI? Uh, well, CT urography is a standard investigation, but if the patient is allergic to iogenetic contrast, then yes, uh, we can advise MRI uh, uh, with other, other investigations to look for the upper unit tract, like ureteroscopy and something. Sir, uh, Dr. Nadeem, please, if you uh, want to elaborate something or add any point. So yes, um, uh, MRI is actually superior because it uh, uh, shows more of the muscle invasion. For the if we are looking into the pelvic uh, lymph node, then they are both equal for showing the pelvic lymph node. But for the muscle invasion or location of the tumor, uh, MRI is superior than CT. But however, both is is okay to do whichever available for you. There may be some resource restriction. The one of the important one here is also uh, uh, this. This uh, must be done the mapping of the bladder, uh, which is because there are some diffuse tumor which may not appear on CT or MRI, and uh, and then we should have the from the cystoscopy report the location of the tumor mapped on the bladder. Not very accurate, but at least a good guide for us. Yes, sir. Okay, thank you, sir. I'd just like to highlight here that we are discussing the case of a patient who has presented with hematuria and obstructive symptoms. Yes. Yes, Dr. Mario. Okay, so imaging showed mass of six centimeter size uh, with no peridocycle extension. Uh, so uh, role of TURBT is very important because if the TURBT is uh, maximal TURBT is done and it, uh, muscle is also including in, included in the pathology specimen, then we can proceed further. Uh, and uh, after TURBT, if the muscle is missing, then we will do redo after around six months. Six weeks. Within uh, six, six weeks. Six weeks. So if histopathology showed muscle invasive bladder cancer and uh, further workup has been uh, done and it came out to be uh, clinically T2N0 M0 disease. So uh, we will actually uh, for a case scenario like we have done CT urogram, we have done, the patient has uh, underwent TURBT. The histopathology showed a transitional uh, herothelial carcinoma hybrid. Firstly, the muscle was not included in the specimen. Then the TURBT was uh, repeated. It was uh, advised to have been repeated. And then within six weeks, the, the TURBT has shown to be a muscle invasive bladder cancer. Then what next? 
uh, we have to look for certain uh, for a complete blood count for biochemistry for renal function tests very important to that because we have to look for a, a platen uh, uh, creating clearance chest imaging is very important because we have to look for lung mats uh, bone scan is not uh, uh, done in all of the cases if the patient is symptomatic or if the patient has a uh, raised alkaline phosphatase then yes the bone scan can be done uh, and pet ct is a category 2b and uh, as such uh, there is no definite role of pet ct in say urinary bladder uh, sir please if you can add Uh, should we move forward? I have a question. Yes, please. All right. So, if the TRBT, if the TRBT is done and the muscle is there in the specimen, um, but the histopath comes out to be T1 high grade trans transitional cell, we know that we need to go back in this scenario. So, what is the reason behind this, and uh, um, how much will be upgraded? And uh, what, what are the further implications of this step? And how uh, long after the initial uh, we need to do the repeat in T1 high grade transitional cell? Thanks, Dr. Maria. Uh, actually, uh, when the TURPT must be repeated, yes. Number one, when it is a T1 high grade tumor, we have to uh, repeat it within six weeks because about 50% of the patients, they are upstate to a muscle invasive disease. Then a uh, second one is there are three indications. Number one indication is that if a T1 high grade, you have to go for the PQRBT. Second is when the muscle is not included in the specimen, you have to uh, uh, resend the patient for the PQRBT. And the third one is when you are planning for bladder preservation and uh, incomplete PQRBT has been done, there is a residual tumor and uh, uh, you want a maximum PQRBT done, then you again send the patient, refer the patient for uh, this procedure. I Can I ask a question also here that if the if we are planning for trimodality treatment and TURBT done, for example, two, three months ago, would you repeat the TURBT in this situation as well? Um, because that? ideally we want to start the radiation within within six weeks of the TURBT if we are going for trimodality treatment, not for T1 high grade, for any patient selected for TUR for the trimodality treatment. And if TURBT has done like, you know, in our situation, we see the cases where they be, it is being done like three months back um, and we don't have any new cystoscopy or TRBT data. In those patients, would you prefer to do a second look, cystoscope sir, and decide? Yeah. Okay. Sir, what we Go need on. is uh, we get help from ultrasound. Ultrasound uh, of the kidney urinary bladder. It gives us very uh, important information about regarding the size of the residual tumor. And if there is residual tumor and we are planning for the bladder preservation approach, we do uh, refer them back for maximum QRBT if it is possible or not. We do get the urologist's opinion in those cases. Okay, so but there was some experience I have in Middle East that they, if the TRBT done long time back, even at that time point, they did maximal resection. And by the time they refer for for the trimodality treatment, there was a delay of few months. Okay. And when we when I refer back to urology, they did the cystoscope, and some of them they found the tumor recurrence already within this period of time, or maybe it was not completely removed in the beginning, but however not reported that way. And then they did in some cases they just did second look uh, cystoscope, and they said there is nothing residual is still same clean and send back to me, or in some patient, they do further resection. So I don't know, you get the same experience there in Pakistan as well. That's what I was trying to, to understand. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, thank you, sir. Let's move forward with our case. So uh, next, after uh, the stitching work of Really David sorry. I, I have a question. That the maximal TRBT before embarking on to the chemo radiation and therapy, um, like, how is it going to impact the, on the overall survival or the local control? It has if, a, it, if the uh, complete uh, maximal TURBT is done, then it will uh, increase the success rate of bladder preservation and it 
also has a sort of overall survival benefit and uh, there will be increased local control because of the maximal PDRBT if you are uh, preferring the bladder preservation approach. Okay, thank you. Okay, so let's move on. Uh, <clears throat> Next, we will discuss our case in the multidisciplinary board in which uh, we will also involve the urologist, pathologist, medical and radiation oncologist. And our, we will discuss our case because MDT is very important uh, and it is the key to the better outcome. So after discussion in MDT, uh, we uh, discuss the pros and cons of the both uh, because there are two standards of care, as we all know. Uh, current standard of care include uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy followed by the radical cystectomy number one and on number two there is trimodality therapy uh, which includes CCRT so we discuss the pros and cons of uh, both modalities with our patient and uh, we uh, came to the conclusion of uh, to go with the trimodality therapy uh, but first I would like to discuss a few points of the uh, radical cystectomy uh, in which uh, how we will proceed in uh, our patient. So first of all, if uh, we have any patient, we have to consider all these points, uh, the age of the patient, the stage, the comorbidities, and the functional status of the bladder, and uh, the social support of the patient, and, uh, and the psychological status, and the other these factors, because these are all very important before uh, starting the treatment. So uh, this is so this is the try uh, this is the slide uh, showing the comparison between the surgery versus radiotherapy. Uh, these were the initial trials uh, which were done. Uh, Stanek trial included one thousand fifty four cystectomy patients, uh, which showed five and ten year uh, survival of sixty percent and forty three percent. Rodel et al. Uh, for four hundred fifteen patients uh, who received RT and five and 10 year old survival was less than the previous uh, cystectomy, patient, uh, cystectomy patient trial. So in these trials, as you can see the inclusion criteria, there was 213 patients which were taken uh, T0, TA and TIS in these cystectomy series and they excluded the 112 inoperable patients. So this is very important point because we cannot uh, follow this uh, because uh, most of the patients were good performance status and early stage. Uh, so if comparison is restricted to the operable muscle invasive disease, uh, so then five-year overall survival is comparable. As you can see, radical cystectomy is 47%, conservative therapy 45%. So, and also there's only one uh, phase three randomized trial uh, done in the UK, uh, SPARE, uh, it, it, is, it is the name of the trial. So in this trial, only 45 patients were randomized and uh, it included the patients with the muscle invasive bladder cancer and it closed in 2007 due to the poor accrual of the patients. So uh, according to this trial, uh, it showed no difference in overall survival, a trend towards decreased post-treatment treatment grade three for toxicity in the bladder preservation arm and a salvage cystectomy rate was 18% for patients with local recurrence before being TNT. Uh, this is another trial. It said this is a systematic review of the clinical trials and uh, it includes a large number of patients, like 10,000 patients who underwent radical cystectomy and about 3,000 patients who underwent a trimodality therapy. And we can see that the, there was absolute 5% benefit of uh, TMT versus radical cystectomy. The five year overall survival in the surgery uh, patients was 52% uh, as compared to 57% in the TMT arm. So, uh, I would like to ask uh, Dr. Nadeem, what is the current uh, like trend in uh, their setup for muscle invasive bladder cancer patients? Because in the last few years, uh, as we have seen the uh, NCCM guideline, we have seen the CCRT option jumping from category 2B to category 2A and then to category 1. So now these two both options, the new joint chemo followed by surgery, and then the second option is the consumption chemo radiation, which of, of course connects to the URBT. Both options are category one. So uh, in our setup, uh, uh, we have seen that although the surgical expertise, they were not that fine a few years ago, they have now really a good surgical expertise, good, uh, we have good clinicians, good surgeons, 
but again uh, these jumping off the bladder preservation therapy to category 1 it gives us a very positive uh, clue that the most of the patients in the uh, other parts of the world uh, are uh, opting for bladder preservation approach so what are your views in this regard yeah very very good question um, so uh, in reality uh, i we can we are very confident the radiation oncologists we know if there is a correct patient selection then both approaches are very similar if not exactly same if we um, for the for the new adjuvant chemotherapy followed by radical uh, cystectomy versus uh, tri modality treatment so if every steps are followed properly for example maximal turbt concurrent chemo radiation with good choice of chemotherapy selection with it and patient receive all chemotherapy patient selected non hydronephrosis for example or or other or other factors and the patient is willing for salvage cystectomy when it is needed is not the about 20% of the patients uh, in our uh, in our opinion they are equivalent outcome now the if the outcome when we see in the studies reported a little bit in, inferior for uh, radiation arm that's very clear reasons which you already mentioned in a very good presentation your good presentation that either patients said there are selection bias that healthy patients are mostly selected for for the surgery rather than radiation also there are patient included in analysis which does not qualify uh, to compare as muscle invasive so so this is our belief that we are equivalent in good selected patient uh, for both option now the uh, so number one part before i would come to patient i'll come to physicians so urology in our region in oman specifically uh, i face uh, quite a bit of struggle that they don't believe radiation have any role except palliative radiation they believe that if patient is not consenting for uh, radical cystectomy they should be observed and referred to palliative care uh, or for palliative chemotherapy so um it's it was very challenging when i joined here that almost none of the patient were receiving radiation treatment uh, for the bladder cancer and i was limited my uh, my practice was limited to prostate cancer um however this is now changing because of the prostate cancer after starting brachy seed implant uh, are shifting from surgery from urologist and uh, and most of them are coming to us so same as in the bladder cancer when the so this is the physician choice so if if you talk about physician choice in the country i'm practicing now there is no radiotherapy option for them as a radical option uh, for the patient so some of the patients they read by themselves and they insist on uh, for a tri modality approach because of the bladder preservation so they don't want to lose their bladder and for that they insist they're delayed to reach to us because uh, the, the most of the effort is to not to refer to ready therapy center so once they reach to us um, we have a patient are those patients are very determined one who don't want cystectomy at any cost so uh, i am struggling but i believe that uh, both options are equivalent uh, in cell in good selected patients yes sir even we have uh, uh, we have a uh, very good experience of uh, this uh, bladder preservation approach well uh, in our setup uh, when the patient present we actually do a tumor board of uh, the uh, oncologist and uh, if the patient is not suitable for bladder preservation approach then we refer them for uh, for surgery there is also a weekly tumor board being run uh, in our two uh, centers with a specific for bladder surgery pkli and shake that and we are uh, in uh, doing it in coordination with them this is very good approach and mdt always help we have mdt as well but dr nadeem basi have teach us over years that uh, first that mdt is mandatory now it's not an option or a choice which is happening in most region then the he also teach me i learned from him about quality of mdt that if mdt is happening then what is the outcome and what are implications so with with that so uh, we have mdt but we are we did not reach to the level of the good quality mdt so uh, still we struggle and but we are hoping it's is changing and i'm i'm glad to hear that you have a good mdt system where the patients are properly selected this is great yes sir we are also uh, actually uh learning learning and moving forward so yes. okay let's move forward <clears throat> thank you sir
sorry for the delay okay <clears throat> next we are going to discuss the points near joint chemotherapy regimen uh, regimen and its role and cis platin eligible patients uh, so near joint chemotherapy its role has been uh, explained in the abc meta analysis which was done in 2005 and it explained the 5% absolute improvement in survival at 5 years so it has been recommended before radical cystectomy and the chemotherapy options we have two options uh, gemcitabine with cisplatin and the second is dose dense mvac which include uh, these four drugs so uh, what are the, uh, the in comparison both regimens are uh, uh, comparable uh, because uh, uh, but the dose dense mvac has a higher local control rate uh, but uh, the grade three or higher anemia febrile neutropenia and other toxicity profile Uh, will lead us to uh, go with the gems uh, regime, and uh, and we can also see in the recent trial uh, named by the Vesper trial, which was published in ASCO Jiru two thousand twenty, which explained the three year uh, PFS benefit of um, which was improved in the dose dense MVAC arm versus the gems cytopine and cisplatin arm. Actually, uh, we do have uh, data. Uh, the dose of MVAC is like uh, less toxic than uh, is superior than MVAC in the metastatic setting, and then we have category one evidence for gemsis being comparable to DD MVAC in metastatic setting also. For this muscle invasive uh, bladder tumors, who uh, bladder patients in which surgery is planned for new joint chemo, this trial uh, has compared both of the two arms, and uh, due to the lesser side effects of gemsis. Uh, for the patients who have to undergo for surgery, this is our usual practice to give them three cycles of this chemotherapy regime: gemcitabine and cisplatin. We have not uh, experience of giving this dose as MVAC. So, if you have an experience of giving it, so in, in in most of the setup in the world, this is cisplatinum based chemo, which is mostly cisplatin, uh, gemcitabine, uh, or cisplatinum. And uh, actually, if there are there are some data showing some superiority of mvac but also there are data which is saying equal response with the uh, cisplatin or gemsis based uh, chemo to be equivalent and uh, there are some concern about the side effects of mvac uh, so i in my experience in different countries i found a more common regime is cisplatinum uh, with gemsis if they give or uh, and if not then they go carboplat or, or other option yes sir <clears throat> All right, so Dr. Nasir is here. Uh, sir has a comment to share. Sir, please. Okay, please. sir, go ahead. Assalamu alaikum, uh, Nadim Bhai. How are you? Okay. Uh, Jai Bhai. Who is it? Who is it? Nadim's ko po keh rahe. How are you? I am fine. No, 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 no. Both are Nadim. अच्छा इसमें आई हैव टू मेक अ कमेंट हियर दैट फर्स्ट रैंडमाइज्ड ट्रायल ऑफ इट्स ओन काइंड व्हिच कंपेयर्ड जेमसाइटाबिन वर्सेस एमवैक रेजिम ऑफ केमोथेरेपी दैट वाज पब्लिश्ड इन जेसीओ इन 1998 एंड इन दैट ट्रायल दे शोड दैट द रिस्पोंसेस वर ऑलमोस्ट इक्वल इन बोथ द रेजिम्स बट द पेशेंट द टॉक्सिसिटी प्रोफाइल of mvac was much worse as compared to the gemcitabine cisplatin um if we see that uh, trial less than 80% of the patients were able to receive the scheduled doses of mvac chemotherapy while almost 100% patients uh, received gemcitabine cisplatin scheduled uh, doses of chemotherapy so uh, this was the first trial which uh, changed the practice that patients were not usually because these patients are usually elderly they were not able to tolerate mvac and uh, so the then after that the new standard of chemotherapy was accepted as gemcitabine and cisplatin so that was my comment thank you sir thank you thank you dr nasir i just noticed that you know dr ikram is here on board as well and he uh, practice uh, gu medical oncology if dr ikram can give us uh, some comment about it better one than us thank you very Salam much uh, and assalam alaikum to assalam alaikum to everybody and uh, 
Um, I agree with what has been said about the choice between chemotherapy. Both are category one on uh, NCCN guidelines. If you review the most recent, both are category one. However, we have to look at in the perspective of uh, our own population. Um, I have used MVAC uh, quite a bit. Uh, the, the issue with MVAC is that on day uh, uh, 15 and 22, when you use intermediate dose methotrexate, it is not easy. Um, and as Nasser said a while back, most patients would not be able to continue. Furthermore, what we also know is that the MVAC should be dense, dose dense, which is giving every two weeks, which includes the use of GCSF. And overall, the regimen becomes fairly expensive. So overall, patients, if they are cisplatin ineligible, they would get GEMSYS, otherwise GEMCARBO. That is a fairly routine practice in most of the places that I have worked and elsewhere as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Maria, do you have any question? No, no, please proceed. Okay, thank you. So next we are going to discuss the cisplatin ineligible patients. Patients with hearing loss or neuropathy, poor performance status or renal insufficiency may not be eligible for cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And by renal insufficiency, we mean that if the creatinine clearance is more than equal to 60, 60 ml per minute, then we will go for the cisplatin-based chemotherapy. And if it is less, then we can give a split course or we can emit cisplatin-based chemotherapy. Uh, and if cisplatin-based chemo cannot be given, neoadjuvant chemotherapy is not recommended. And cystectomy alone is an appropriate option for these patients because carboplatin has not demonstrated any survival benefit and should not be substituted for cisplatin in the perioperative setting. But as uh, has been discussed by Dr. Ikram, they have good experience of given carbo, gem carbo in the new adjuvant setting. So yes, I think, uh, uh, this, although we don't have a published data, but yes, for cisplatin ineligible patients, if new adjuvant chemotherapy is to be given before surgery, yes, gem carbo can be given. Please comment, sir. Can I just say uh, here, that is where the role of tumor board is very important because if we are talking of a T2 N0 disease, you could think of uh, using cystectomy alone, but should there be any note, any degree of node positivity? So what you have shown already in the earlier slides is that the addition of neoadjunctive chemotherapy and not adjuvant chemotherapy uh, improves the overall survival by 5%. And that is where the NCCN is fairly clear uh, and distinguishes or, 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 or uh, classifies patients into cisplatin eligible and cisplatin ineligible patients. So with eligibility, cisplatin uh, with gemcitabine is a standard. Otherwise, gem carbo should be offered, particularly if the nodes are positive. Obviously, there are other things as well, which are coming up like the use of atezolizumab and pembrolizumab, and maybe you would uh, mention it later on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. So next we are going to discuss these points, uh, the response evaluation, when it should be done, post chemotherapy and the timings of cystectomy. And uh, then later on, we will discuss the indications of a given chemo, chemo and uh, Usually after chemotherapy, after three to four weeks, we uh, usually do response evaluation with and then we refer the patient for surgery to our urologist. The time of cystectomy is when the patient has got a complete uh, uh, blood uh, blood count and then uh, within after four to six weeks of last cycles of chemo the patient uh, they do have the surgery and uh, for uh, indications of adjuvant chemo if the patients uh, they came out to be t3 t4 node positive disease adjuvant chemo is a must for the patient who have not received new adjuvant chemo uh, but if the patient they have received new adjuvant chemo and then again there is a residual disease t3 t4 node positive or margin positive disease then there is a role of uh, giving adjuvant uh, nivolumab. Uh, as with adjuvant RT, uh, due to the, the uh, ball toxicity, due to the uh, surgical post of you know, complications, uh, we have no experience of giving adjuvant RT in these patients. Uh, after cystectomy, we give adjuvant chemo. I would like to ask if uh, uh, Dr. Nadeem or Dr. Nasti, if they are giving adjuvant RT to these patients or not. So it's a very good question and controversial point that uh, people were debating and there were there are some phase two randomized study being done where they showed 
50 grain, 25 fraction in adjuvant setting for the patient with uh, positive margin, node positive or T3, T4 disease were given and shown advantage of radiation treatment uh, in the local, con local regional control. For, <clears throat> for, the, for this reason, RTUG planned a large multi-institutional study where they were offering 50.4 in 28 fraction to, to the similar group of the patient. And unfortunately, the study uh, did not uh, reach to the accrual because people were not believing it. Uh, and uh, the past study, which was done using the, uh, the 3D conformal technique rather than IMRT. So there is no current data uh, and, and the concern is toxicity. There's no one dispute that there is a disease free survival advantage, but what they worried about the toxicity post-surgery for whole pelvic radiation. With the in, improvement in the technology, there is no current study performed, but analysis of whatever patient in, enrolled in RTUG before it closed due to poor accrual, their assessment shows the toxicity rate was not increased so high. Uh, there was some increase. And however, the benefit of the radiation was there as well. So I, I would say in my practice, I treated patients when they have these indications with IMRT and 3D, uh, sorry, IMRT and IGRT technique with 50.4 in 28 fractions. And I did not find uh, uh, is intolerable and uh, uh, and I cannot claim any benefit because it was not on, on a clinical trial. It was just a clinical experience. Thank you. All right, Dr. Nasser. Yes, I completely agree to Dr. Nadeem's uh, views because there are, up till now, there is no randomized data for giving radiation or not give, giving radiation. But whenever there are some high risk features like uh, node positive with extra capsule extension or margin positive, then these patients uh, can be considered for radiation or should be considered for radiation. And by using IMRT, we can limit the toxicity of the small bowel. Right. Thank you. <clears throat> OK, thank you, sir. So <clears throat> according to the literature, adjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy is the preferred approach in adjuvant setting. If cisplatin-based neoadjuvant therapy was not given before and the tumor is found to be pathological T3, T4, or not positive following the section, Although adjuvant nivolumab may also be considered because it has shown the uh, benefit of TFS of uh, around uh, 20 months versus 10 months uh, when it was compared with placebo. Uh, and studies have shown that adjuvant chemotherapy may delay recurrences and improve DFS and overall survival. A meta-analysis of six trials found a 25% mortality reduction with adjuvant chemotherapy, but the authors that evidence is insufficient for treatment decisions. So when so partial cystectin on the last slide? Yes, sure. Dr. Kram, do you have any comments on adjuvant chemo? Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, it's, it's very clear what has been said over here is that uh, uh, the standard, uh, according to the NCCN and elsewhere, is still new adjunctive chemotherapy in all the selected patients. And that is particularly if there is a node positivity. However, if you have missed the opportunity for new adjunctive chemotherapy and you find node positive disease, then obviously adjuvant chemotherapy is given by extrapolation. And as has been shown on the slide already, uh, that there are uh, there is a reduction, but it is um, uh, it, it is something which is uh, still not met the same highest level of evidence as the new use of neoadjunctive chemotherapy. I think I would just like to highlight the very, very important role of site-specific tumor board because there is so much of information which is coming out now that unless you go into the details of the, of the staging um, and, and, and look at the, uh, dissect the disease very carefully right at the start, it becomes difficult to generalize the, uh, the uh, treatment later on. Um, uh, there is, for example, you know, I'll, I'll just give you an example. Uh, there was a discussion about whether it should be a CT scan or MRI at the start. Um, from my colleagues, I know that uh, since uh, urothelial cancers can be multifocal uh, as well, so you do a CT urography to look to see 
if there were a tumor in the renal pelvis or higher up as well. So, so those are small little things which um, I think would come out in site-specific tumor board. And I would like to congratulate uh, Dr. Nadeem Abbasi and Dr. Nadeem Parvez uh, both for, for conducting these, being an advocate for site-specific tumor boards. And I think that is what we all need to uh, sort of uh, uh, take uh, uh, into our stride, that we should uh, and and I can see there are about 26 participants here, and, and there would be many more because sometimes you have got more uh, participants on on uh, than the number of uh, uh, participants seen on the Zoom uh, chat. Um, it's important that we actually uh, uh, try to uh, go into minor details uh, to be able to uh, help our uh, patients. Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Ikram, I have a question. Uh, actually, yeah. uh, we have emerging research data about the role of the immunotherapies in new adjuvant setting. Also, even in concurrent uh, CCRT with CCRT or RT with immunotherapy. Uh, this is uh, one point we missed in our presentation. Uh, we want to know your uh, point on uh, this view, your point of view on this regard. And as we know, there are certain phase two trials going on. The results are available, but uh, in guidelines as such, uh, we don't find options of uh, immunotherapy in your adjuvant or the uh, concurrent setting. So what, what's your thought? I fully agree with what you said. There are emerging data and up until there is a strong clinical evidence, we should not get into using those sorts of drugs uh, into our routine clinical practice. If we were to use any of those immunotherapy or other uh, drugs like L4, uh, folate alpha receptor diagnosis, et cetera, that should be in the setting of a clinical trial in new adjunctive setting. And may I just say that with now, uh, mashallah, you have got so many uh, people from so many different centers. It is something which is easy for you, for one of yourselves who could lead uh, the, um, uh, the site-specific uh, 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 treatment is to is to design a randomized trial in in Pakistan, and that would be a huge and a great contribution. Thank you, oh, thank uh, Doctor Sam. I totally agree. Actually, the these details when you go to individual patient cannot be made decisions without the help of a MDT. And you can see that now we are radiation oncologists, and Doctor Ikram when he enter. He helped us a lot for medical oncology decision. And, you know, Dr. Tonio, Tonio have done one study, uh, which is quoted in international era and with the name of Pakistan about lymph node versus no lymph node radiotherapy uh, treatment from one single center. So I think as Dr. Ikram suggested, any multi-institutional studies run in Pakistan will have very heavy weight uh, in this area. Thank you very much. <laughs> Okay, thank you so much. So let's discuss uh, when partial cystectomy is an option. Actually, partial cystectomy is not gold standard surgical procedure for muscle invasive bladder cancer, uh, but we can consider in patients if uh, there is clinical T2, uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer, single lien, or the location of the lien is at the dome of bladder, two centimeter far from urethral orifices and bladder neck, and there is no evidence of carcinoma in situ. Uh, and the contraindication is lien in the trigone of bladder. So, uh, is there anything uh, someone wants to add, uh, Dr. Nadeem Parvesab? Did you ever see a patient with partial cystectomy? I didn't see in no. my experience. No, but sir. No, what sir. You mentioned? Yeah, and but but your experience, what you wrote is actually literature based that um, it can be performed in very selected cases. Uh, they are urethral related or they are adenocarcinoma. There are multiple, you know, points around that, but I haven't seen in my experience. Okay, sir. thank you. So ideal candidates for bladder preservation, as we all know, we have to be very specific while selecting the patients for bladder preservation, uh, which will include the uh, uh, location of the lien, depth of invariant, size of the tumor, and status of the uninvolved urethelium, and status of the patient. Uh, in which we will see the bladder capacity and we will assess the bladder function of the uh, patient. And we will also look for the comorbidities if there are any. Uh, and bladder preservation will be uh, used as an alternative to cystectomy if the patient uh, will have smaller solitary tumors, negative node, no extensive or multifocal CIS, no tumor related, moderate or severe hydronephrosis, and good pre treatment bladder function. 
uh, actually, uh, sir, uh, what uh, do you do in the patient who present with hydronephrosis? Like uh, with uh, uh, like with relieving hydronephrosis, do you uh, uh, prefer to go for uh, organ preservation or not? So yes, yeah, so this is a good point. There are lots of literature from Massachusetts General Hospital and other studies where they showed that if the hydronephrosis is tumor related, for example, tumor is at the orifice of ure ure uh, ureter and the bladder. In those cases, the outcomes are slightly inferior and they may require surgery afterward. So I prefer those patients who have uh, cancer related hydronephrosis to not to select for organ preservation, but there are times when Pay, there is a surgery option is not available. In those cases, we ask uh, urologists uh, to put the stent or any other methods for uh, for relieving that hydronephrosis, and then we have to go for uh, treatment, radiation treatment. And also, uh, I want to uh, know the point of node positive disease. For every node positive patient, do you prefer uh, cystectomy or? Uh, for uh, neurogen chemotherapy followed by the presentation approach. Yeah, so again, very good question. In your initial slide, your presentation was very good. We summarize all that. Our preference is to take muscle invasive, but not, not node positive as, uh, as the first choice because we want to select the patient who get the equivalent result like the radical cystectomy uh, uh, and with the organ preservation. So node positive does not fall into that category. But then again, there are times when uh, node positive, because you know that if they are node positive and they can be operated on, so there'll be selected lymphadenectomy because extensive lymphadenectomy did not uh, improve the survival and therefore uh, they can have the surgery. And then we can consider them for adjuvant radiation or adjuvant concurrent chemo radiation, even in the cases where new adjuvant chemo is not given. But in, in case a patient, again, same scenario like uh, uh, hydronephrosis, that patient are not eligible for surgery or patient declines surgery. In those cases, I have treated patient with node positive disease and we treated with the full dose to the lymph node, like radical doses which we deliver into the, uh, to the bladder. Oh, thank you, sir. <clears throat> so how to evaluate the bladder function? <clears throat> For the assessment, we uh, we can use the FACT BI scales, uh, which include the physical well-being, social well-being, sexual well-being, and also includes the bladder function assessment. In bladder function assessment, there is a very uh, large questionnaire uh, which we have to fill. Uh, then we have to score further. Uh, the questionnaire includes uh, the question like uh, how often the patient urinate, uh, and is it associated with the coughing, sneezing, or exercise. So such questions are asked, then we will uh, assess if the bladder function of the patient is adequate and we can proceed for bladder preservation or not. So uh, actually, uh, these scales are available online. Uh, we have just, uh, we searched. But clinically, what we do is that we ask patients that how often they have to get up uh, at night while sleeping to urinate and how often they urinate in the daytime. Uh, as Specific, there are no such uh, like specific point uh, at what we discuss is a good bladder function or bad bladder function. It is the uh, subjective, you can say. So what is your uh, point of view? Very good question. I ask you a question about that. Did you ever decided a patient not to treat with chemo radiation because of bladder function ever in your experience? Sir, uh, I remember one patient in which uh, he, uh, he, uh, like he was unable to hold urine for more than 15 minutes. There was okay. multiple, uh, and, and there were multiple tumors. There were cross thickening of the urinary bladder and the bladder function was very poor. So we have to uh, refer her uh, refer okay. surgery. Yeah, that's a good uh, practice. So uh, uh, for my practice uh, so far, when I was in Canada, uh, in those days, patients were not selected based on the bladder function. They try to assess what are the factors we can make a, a tri-modality regime fail because of the bladder function future. Couldn't find that. So they couldn't relate with chemotherapy, couldn't relate with radiation. Could So we decided in our center there that uh, we we ask the patient question. And if someone, unless someone have extreme problem, then this factor will not be included in decision. In, in here, where my practice in Middle East, we don't have much choice of discussion around that because patient either decided, patient or patient's physician either decided to go for 
radical surgery route or radiotherapy when there is no choice, no alternative choice. So then in those cases, we don't have that power to select the patient which route to go. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. <clears throat> Sir, I have a question. <clears throat> Sir, while we are discussing about the candidates, the optimal candidates for bladder preservation, we do come across a figure of uh, less than six centimeters and uh, that uh, patient with a tumor that is less than six centimeters in size is uh, optimal or perhaps an ideal candidate for bladder preservation. Although we do know that in our clinical practice, we end up offering radiation to patients who are not positive and with CIS components as well. But the six centimeter cutoff, uh, what is the background behind this? So there are some studies which shows that larger tumor may not be completely resected during the TRBT procedures, and therefore it is better to go for cystectomy. But actually, I would say I, I don't consider that way. I just uh, say that if the patient don't have uh, multi-site or too extensive uh, uh, in-situ component, then um, a size may not matter as much as, as, as long as TRBT is maximal or complete. So the six centimeter criteria, uh, not I, I don't consider as long as it is being removed. So the, the, the selection criteria which we talk about are for ideal candidate. The candidate, when you have both options available and patient can go either route and then you want to select the best possible uh, scenario. And in those cases, all indication like size or, you know, then you go into more details that whether tuberculosis is complete or not, patient have in-situ disease, hydronephrosis is there or not. So all those factors, you can you then look not positive or not negative. But when it comes to the limited choice, when the patient refused for, uh, for the surgery or patient is not eligible for surgery due to medical comorbidities and patient have no other choice left and all these selection criteria does not apply uh, to those patients because then this is the last and only try we do. Sir, I have one more question. Like yes. we, uh, we talk about maximum TURBT. Actually, what yes. is maximum TURBT? Because the TURBT expertise, they vary from urologists to urologists. So is there yes. any specific cutoff line? Yeah, so, uh, you know, actually it should be, ideally it should be complete. Uh, not in some cases cannot be. So then it is very subjective on the urologist basis that how much and therefore MDT role is very, very important here that you communicate with the urologist. So they, they will tell you that we cannot remove or resect more than that into RBT setup. We can only do in radical cystectomy setup to remove all, but into RBT setup, this is the maximum we can do. But also second look cystoscope, I would call, this is, I'm using my own term, you don't have to adopt that, but you know, the urologists, when I talk to them, they do, uh, uh, if the tumor is bigger and they say they, they could not do that, they're not sure about complete resection. There are times when they are themselves not sure about complete resection. Then they go for second look after four, between four to six weeks. And in that second look, if they find that is maximal remove or cannot remove anymore, they just do cystoscopy and uh, come back and inform me or if they have room to remove, they set up both cystoscope and resection uh, for that procedure, and they do further resection. Or sometime, as I told you, if it is a longer time between TRBT and referral to radiation treatment, then they may also have to resect again because to remove the tumor as much as possible. Thank you, sir. Let's move forward. So let's discuss these points, RT versus CCRT and new driven chemotherapy followed by CCRT. So these are the trials, uh, as you can see, uh, which compared RT versus CCRT and they, these are the randomized uh, controlled trials which showed improved uh, overall survival benefit with the CCRT as compared with the RT. Uh, in RTOG 8903, uh, the overall survival benefit was 36 versus 40%. And uh, in James et al. trial, which was done in 2012, there was a two-year local recurrence free survival, uh, which was 67% versus 54%. So it, there's a significant improvement in overall survival with CCRT as compared with RT. And these are the trials which uh, showed the improved overall survival uh, when we compared neurotruent chemotherapy followed by CCRT uh, with CCRT alone. 
This is a randomized phase three study, uh, which was done in our neighboring country. And uh, in this study, uh, we compared new joint chemotherapy followed by CCRT with CCRT alone. And uh, the results showed three year bladder preservation in new joint chemotherapy followed by CCRT arm patients, which is 62%. And in only CCRT, there is 54%. Uh, so it, there is a 8% uh, benefit at three years. Uh, I would like to ask that, uh, like in our clinical practice, we have longer queues. We can, uh, we have experience of giving your joint chemo before CCRT uh, because although we don't, we didn't have much uh, phase three data available, but uh, we used to give your joint chemo before CCRT. So, what is your uh, experience? Do you give upfront? That's uh, a very good question. You know, there are many things in bladder cancer is not standard proven by phase one is uh, or randomized trial like level one evidence but there are practices going around and um, uh, difficult to comment on that because when i was working in canada they start with uh, medical oncology was the lead uh, for bladder cancer because of the selection bias of radiation oncologists or mostly by surgeons so they were doing, giving the new adjuvant chemotherapy first and after new adjuvant chemotherapy if there is a partial a response or complete response, they proceed with CCRT. Um, and uh, if the response is, if the disease is stable after new adjuvant chemo or progressive disease, then they refer them to surgeon for cystectomy. That was one of the good approach. And, uh, but that approach did not compare new adjuvant uh, uh, CCR plus CCRT versus only CCRT. So uh, this study did not uh, come through. I didn't see this study. I missed to read it if you don't mind forward to me. Uh, but you know, there was a need to have that comparison. If this is a good uh, randomized trial, then uh, I would not disagree with this approach. But as you said, you have experience. So what is your experience in this area? Okay, sure. So, so actually we have uh, good experience. Uh, we uh, actually, our uh, Dr. Ariba was our resident and she has compiled all the data. I was uh, unable to uh, collect that data from her. I will share inshallah with you in coming session. That would be great. Thank you. You know, it would be helpful to us as well. Okay. These are the chemotherapy regimens in bladder preservation yes. therapy. Yes, Dr. Maria. Yes, Dr. Maria. Uh, actually, I wanted to ask regarding the radiotherapy doses, uh, like uh, do you offer the hypofractionated regimes or the conventional ones? And if the conventional ones, what are the, uh, okay, so it is coming in the next slides. Let's discuss yes. it later then. Yes. All right, thank you. Okay, so chemotherapy regimens include cisplatin-based chemotherapy, MCV, and three weekly cisplatin. Actually, uh, these four uh, regimens are included in this in guideline, but what we usually uh, use is that 40 milligram per meter cisplatin weekly. And for patients who are ineligible, the platin ineligible, we give them 5 mitomycin according to the BC2001 trial. Sir, what is your experience? For chemotherapy, I would see if Dr. Ikram is around and he can give the comment will be great. Uh, what's the specific question, please, over here? Uh, is, uh, it the, is, is it the is it the uh, combination of new adjunctive chemotherapy or something else? Uh, it, it is actually concurrent chemo radiation. Concurrent chemo radiation, which chemotherapy uh, schedules you are using? Uh, concurrent chemo radiation. Uh, 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 still, platinum-based chemotherapy is uh, widely used, uh, like in other uh, uh, areas. Um, <clears throat> um, gemcitabine is, sorry. Uh, you're using three weekly cisplatin or the weekly cisplatin mm -hmm. radiation? Use of cisplatin, uh, but I, uh, we do not use a lot of concurrent chemo radiation these days. I don't know, uh, Nadeem, uh, Dr. Nadeem Parvez yes. can uh, yes. highlight okay. on that. Dr. Uh, Tram, yes, we, we were using the weekly regime because of some advantages that you know the the weekly regime have uh, do no do not did this much hydration and uh, patient hospital admission uh, for hydration so we were using mostly weekly regime thank you uh, okay sir i have like okay. other cancers like head and neck cancers and cancer of the cervix uh, weekly regimen is widely used because of the reasons that dr nadeem uh, stated 
Say if the creatinine clearance is borderline, uh, like 40 to 60 ml per minute, uh, then can we give a split course of cisplatin like 15 milligram per meter square day one to three weekly as I have read uh, this. Is it feasible for the patients? Yeah, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it becomes a question then of a really clinical judgment. Um, anything less than 60 mils per minute, you have to be very, very careful uh, in giving cisplatin. And the question also is, how do you assess creatinine clearance? Are you using the Cockroft formula to calculate it, or have you done a uh, the, the creatinine clearance study uh, you, uh, using the radioisotope? Um, and obviously, there is a there is a difference, particularly in patients who are uh, most of the bladder cancer patients are uh, in their 60s and 70s with a reduced muscle mass. It, be, it can be very tricky to uh, assess creatinine clearance only based on the Cockroft formula. Uh, so if there is a doubt, then better not to use cisplatin uh, because obviously cisplatin has to be repeated several times. Um, unless, of course, you know that there is a reversible cause, for example, obstruction or uh, infection or pre-renal azotemia, where you can treat and then continue with cisplatin. Otherwise, it's tricky. Oh, sir, you use gemcitabine in those patients or if I have uh, mitomycin C? Uh, gemcitabine in very low doses can be used. Uh, mitomycin C, I don't think even if we have it available in the in the pharmacy anymore, mitomycin C is largely a drug of the of yesteryears. It's uh, it's uh, uh, it is still used in some conditions like. Uh, cancer of the anal canal, et cetera. But uh, gemcitabine is also not an easy drug to use together with radiation. It has got a, a significant toxicity. So uh, try to use cisplatin or carboplatin. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> sir, uh, like it's a question I have not read anywhere, but uh, are there any trials going on of uh, giving uh, gemcitabine along with RT? Is there any to my knowledge, to my knowledge, no. Capecitabine is used in rectal cancer widely, as you know. Uh, yes. But in bladder cancer, I'm not aware of that. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Gemcitabine. This is a Sanya, good question. Sanya, gemcitabine has been used in cervical cancer uh, with concurrent uh, treatment. Yes. Sir. And and we were part of the one trial in which they compared cisplatin alone versus gemcitabine and cisplatin dual chemotherapy with as radiation sensitizer. So it, it is tolerated well uh, if given a uh, maximum dose of 200 milligram every week. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Let's discuss uh, patient positioning and immobilization for CT simulation. It is a very important part when we are delivering uh, radiation to the patient. Patient, uh, first of all, we will uh, counsel the patient regarding the radiation treatment which we are going to give and the side effect profile, and we will take consent from the patient. Uh, then for CT simulation, uh, patient is uh, patient supine in the treatment position with arms folded across the chest with ankle supports to stabilize the leg and pelvis and a knee support for comfort. And the bladder and rectum should be empty to reduce organ motion and interfectional variation. And uh, for uh, bladder cancer, we always uh, simulate the patient with the bladder empty. And a small volume of foreign contrast is given one hour before the planning CT to show the small wall, although we don't do it in our setup. Uh, and a scan is performed with three to five mm slices from the lower border of L5 to the inferior border of the ischial fibrosities. And the anterior tattoo is placed over the pubic symphysis and two lateral tattoos over the eyelid press to prevent lateral rotation with radio opaque markers used for location on the scan and MRI or CT fusion may be useful later on. Uh, sir, I want to ask, do you use the oral contrast for bowel? Uh, no, I don't use oral contrast anymore because it, for the bladder cancer, it is very easy to mark the bladder itself and rest all I draw as, uh, as peritoneal cavity. So take all the possible location of uh, small bowels. And if some small bowels is very close to bladder wall, or bladder, then we I do draw them as separate for to have the DVHS. But we know that in patients who did not have previous pelvic surgery, their bowels will be moving. So in bladder cancer, we do accept slightly higher doses to small bowel because we know their position is not same on every day. And then we confirm that by cone beam CT uh, during the treatment. Okay, 
So yeah. I don't mark uh, small bowels separately. Okay. And sir, uh, do you uh, use uh, empty bladder for simulation and then for treatment purposes? Yes, yeah. So empty bladder has some role, mostly for prostate cancer, but not so much for bladder, but it does. So I just give them like milk of magnesia, a 30 mils BID uh, three days before simulation. And also I ask them not to have the uh, uh, this uh, uh, high residual diet and that dietitian can guide guide them. So then that way they have empty rectum. And after CT simulation, they will go back to their routine food and then come back for radiation. Then again, three days before we inform patient or remind patient to start the same process and continue during radiotherapy. However, in about middle of radiotherapy, when the radiation itself induced some loose motion or diarrhea to patients, then those cases we cut down or stop milk of magnesia and so for the bladder? rest of uh, comfortably uh, for the, uh, Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So this is a very, very good question. Uh, this started with the, one of the Glasgow study where they did phase one treatment when there were two phases of treatment. So <clears throat> we'll come to the doses and phases of treatment later, but in the two phases when they were treating the whole pelvic lymph node, in phase one, they were using the full bladder. And then afterward, they were, for the second phase, they were doing the empty bladder and they do plan both upfront and then switch from, in phase one, from full to empty bladder. However, my own experience in, when I was in cross cancer, I've done multiple small studies presented in, in astro as abstract and not in that article. And I found the easiest reproducible method is to ask patient to uh, pass the urine before radiation treatment and we treat the entire treatment with the, with the empty bladder. Now the time with Glasgow suggested uh, full bladder in phase one was when we were using 3D uh, technique where the small bowels cannot be prevented as a box technique of radiotherapy delivery. But now we have IMRT. So we mark the bladder and we mark the bowel. So then in that sense, we can avoid the doses to the, uh, to the bowel. So we, uh, in my experience now, I, all my patient, I do empty bladder, which is empty bladder from patient perspective, not by using catheter or anything, just patient will pass the urine before go to bed. And then we do cone beam CT on daily basis to check that bladder is not out of the field. Thank you, Thank you sir. Thank you. Sir, we also, uh, we also have the same practice here at our institute. I would like to ask about the ITV. So for the sake of ITV, do you give a, any specific margin or two sets of CT are done at planning like a full bladder and an empty bladder and then the ITV incorporated accordingly? So uh, yes. what do you do? So, um, for, so uh, for, for the moment that we don't have workload so much, so I do just one scan and I don't use ITV, I just uh, uh, treat the patient based on the, if as long as the bladder and bladder tumor area is within PTV, then we treat based on that day CB, CBCT. So because we do daily CBCT, so then if the patient bladder is out of the PTV, uh, that day we ask the patient to pass more urine, uh, go to a washroom or go walk uh, and then come back after an hour and pass more urine and come back for the treatment. With this approach, we find that um, all patients actually were able to reproduce. However, if, if, if this situation comes that, you know, uh, where I, I didn't find this clinically uh, apply, applied to me that I may use catheter to drain the urine more, or we can have two sets of plan with the moderate filling, uh, no filling, or, you know, high filling, like different sets of, and then apply the day that's called adaptive. You can say that adaptive radiotherapy where you can apply the plan of the day based on how much filling of that day bladder is. But I found I don't need to do this in my patients. Right, and what is the like PTV margin you usually give to the CTV? <clears throat> so I'm using one, yes, one centimeter all around and about, uh, about seven to eight millimeter posteriorly to avoid some rectal. So in our setup, uh, previously we were giving two centimeter margin to the whole bladder all around PTV margin, but right. now we have changed. Uh, now we are uh, give, uh, giving two PTV margin and making two plans, uh, one PTV margin and with empty bladder simulation after. Uh, so uh, yeah. one PTV margin of one centimeter and the other PTV margin of 1.5 centimeter. And we do daily CBCT uh, and doing VMAT. 
so on daily uh, basis we uh, see in which plan uh, the target is fitting so we use that plan uh, so nowadays we are uh, following this approach I, I totally agree this is absolutely fantastic approach because ptv margin uh, is actually from 1 to 1.5 cm recommended in the literature so good you have both and you cover on daily basis so just for my knowledge my so how often do you have to apply the uh, 1.5 margin um, uh, during treatment do you so do actually, very often so actually we started uh, this just a month ago uh, we are collecting our data we will definitely share you uh, share this with you uh, so this is yeah. a new thing for us Dr. Maria, this will be you? great this will be great yes. it's a good approach thank you sir thank you sir okay Dr. Maria. Uh, Dr. Maria, do you have any question or uh, what is your preference, Dr. Maria? So please proceed. Uh, I, I was asking, what is your practice? Uh, how uh, much bikini margin do you give? Or do you make separate plans or one single All plan? Right. So, uh, uh, Dr. Nasir is here. Uh, what we do, and uh, Dr. Nasir usually uh, does uh, GU here at our uh, center. What we usually do uh, at the time of planning scan, we acquire two sets of CT for the uh, um, like one with empty and one with full bladder. However, in in some patients, we do uh, realize that there is because they are the bladder cancer patients, there is not much difference between the both sets of CT. So basically, we incorporate that as the ITV and uh, treat uh, as treat daily CBCT. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Marty. So, the GTV is the primary bladder tumor, which is difficult to define on CT alone. Would you like to add something? No, no, please go on. Okay, thank you, sir. So, MRI CT fusion may help uh, in drawing the GTV. So, standard approach is to define the CTV as the GTV, uh, which is the primary tumor and any extra vesicle spread and the whole bladder. Uh, in patients with tumors at the bladder base, the proximal urethra, and in men, the prostate and prostatic urethra are included on the CTV. And CTV nodal includes the uh, regional nodes, which are the primary drainage sites, which include external IA, internal IA, hypogastric, obturator, sacral, and presacral node. And we give a PTV nodal a margin of 0.7 mm all around. And uh, PTV margin to the CTV primary is given uh, as we have discussed. Uh, we can give one centimeter, one point five to up to two centimeter margin. Uh, so radiation therapy doses in the current regimens are total dose of sixty four to sixty six gray is directed to the whole bladder and tumor, while the nodes receive forty to forty five gray at one point eight to two gray per fraction. And alternative fractionation is fifty five gray twenty fractions as per BC two thousand one trial. And elective nodal radiation was typically utilized in RTOG trials, but not in BC 2001. For clinically node positive disease, consider boosting the involved nodes up to 64 gray if safely achievable, achievable. And we will also look for the tolerance rows of the femoral head. Actually, when uh, at Imol we used to uh, treat patients with CDCRT, we uh, used to give. Uh, treat in two phases: first phase of 44 gray, and the next phase of boosting up to 64 gray. Uh, but now, as we have uh, moved on to VMAT, so now 55 year 20 fraction is the fraction schedule we are using, and we are not electively radiating the nodes. But if the patients they had node positive disease, then yes, we uh, do radiate the nodes. So, what is your experience? So, well, it's a very good question. I um, can say that one of the study with Dr. Tony did from Pakistan and published it was. Uh, single institution randomized trial from his institute where he said there was no benefit of uh, elective radiation to the pelvic lymph node and that was the basis for lots of the UK studies where they did not treat. However, the uh, North American practice is that electively uh, treat the pelvic lymph node and the reason they say is that muscle invasive bladder cancer is a systemic disease. It is not only the muscle, it's limited to bladder, bladder wall or uh, or the around surrounding bladder structure so for that reason that you will see very clearly also chemotherapy benefit is coming that may be some because of microscopic disease some because of the synergistic effect so with all this uh, in north america they never accepted beacon uh, uh, practice so there are multiple limitation of that trial they give bladder plus two centimeter margin so that may have covered are lots of the um, lymph node already in their uh, in their volume, um, but uh, and also their 
the publish when they published the week on pooled analysis of two study they combined <clears throat> the both studies together and with that combination if you go into detail only 17 percent of the patient received concurrent chemotherapy so there were some other studies which were phase two trials where they, we found that uh, toxicity was higher when we approached 55 in 20 with the uh, proper chemotherapy, like uh, not like BCON. So with all these factors, actually the, the dose of 55 in 20 is not accepted in North America at all. No one actually follow that. So what we give there is uh, first phase uh, uh, 46 to 50 gray in uh, 23 to 25 fraction in two gray per fraction where we treat the lymph node and entire bladder. And then, you know, the, we get boost to the bladder only up to 66 gray. That's very common practice with concurrent cis platinum of patient eligible. And if not, then cis platinum based like cis, gym cis or the um, or carboplat if it is not eligible. That's a common practice there. Uh, now we are, there are people who are adopting this 55 and 20, but then their volumes are not like 55 and 20 what they use in B-con trials. So then lymph nodes are not that much covered. But as a radiation oncologist, we do understand that if you give moderate hypofractionation with so much margin and concurrent chemotherapy, there may be a concern of toxicity. So I would say 5520 is an alternate uh, regimen of radiation which can be given, but um, 66 in 33 in two phases is also um, standard. So I would not dispute uh, either treatment for, but I favor more in my practice to do elective nodal radiation and boost to the node to the full dose, as you just mentioned, that if there is a lymph node in the pelvis, I go to the full dose, like 66 grain, 33 fraction. And it's doable when you plan carefully. Only the lymph node margin, you can choose to be bigger margin or smaller margin based on the uh, how close it is to the small bowel. But one factor I would say that when you mention about GTV, um, uh, marking, you know, there there is a need of doing a study where GTV boosted in SIB pattern uh, for the um, uh, with, with, in a randomized setup, even phase two, where GTV marked as much as we can, and then boosted SIB in phase two, and see if there is a difference between boosting the GTV versus no boost. Because at the moment, in in two phase study, we treat the entire bladder to 66 gray. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Right, sir. So, in the context of elective nodal RT, uh, is there any practice of SIB, like uh, 50 or 15, yes. 25 nodes, yes. and yes. then what about the phase it two? Is. It is. So, there was a study from McGill, and they did 50 gray in 20 fraction. Instead of uh, 55 in 20, they did 50 in 20. When concurrent SIB boost, and they give the, uh, the pelvic lymph node, as, I think, 44 gray. I don't remember exactly but it was very close to between 40 to 45 gray somewhere where they did the pelvic lymph node and give this dose, but unfortunately the with concurrent chemotherapy. So, but unfortunately the toxicity rate was higher and therefore they don't uh, uh, recommend for concurrent chemotherapy as much. However, one or two physicians still using that. So I think this area need to be explored in Pakistan in their own patient setup that if a small phase two randomized study they can perform or, and compare the 66 gray versus 55 in 25 uh, with concurrent chemotherapy because BCON trial cannot be applied as the patient who received the concurrent chemotherapy was very small in number. So we don't know how would it be tolerated. So I would suggest like really to do a study in, in Pakistan to compare those regime and we may get a good result for all of us to learn from it. Thank you, sir. I have another question. <clears throat> like in the phase two, uh, the, the boost phase uh, after the elective nodal, uh, what we do is we are like radiating the whole bladder as uh, uh, in phase two. Uh, do you practice uh, boosting the uh, gross uh, the gross disease which is in the bladder? Not at the moment, no. I'm also treating the entire bladder as you, as your practice is exactly same for 266 gray. But however, because you know it, where there are there are difficulties in mapping up where the tumor is actually. But however, you know, as the practice I heard, if that practice we can mark uh, GTV, and it may not be ideal marking, but it'll be some gross disease for sure will be captured. And if we do SIP boost to those patients, like boost that dose 
to that GTV in SIB setup up to 70 gray or so, we may get some benefit by doing that approach. But this is not my practice, and this needs to be addressed in a in a trial or a study, even a small study, phase two prospective study or phase two randomized study. Yes, sir. I think we need to be very careful if we are opting for the partial blood irradiation because uh, we have to take random biopsies from all the walls of the bladder and also yes. the maximal PURBT and other factors are also to be taken because this is a very risky approach. I agree. I totally agree with both. And we all aligned in that practice. Like all of us do the phase two as the entire bladder. If we want to do something different and we can map the tumor at least bigger or big chunk of tumor gross disease, we can boost them in a, in a study, like prospective study, but not to compromise the current practice as an additional dose to that GTV. And we can see if there is a benefit. And then we can go to next steps of the study to find out if we can really safely do that for uh, reducing the total bladder dose or, or not in future. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So let's discuss a uh, split course versus continuous course in trimodality therapy. Actually, split course is something that was in guidelines about three to four years back. We used to study uh, first give 40 gray, then reassess the tumor, and then, but in our clinical practice, we have not uh, done it um, once even. So we used to give continuous full course of radiation therapy, 64 to 66 gray, and then after the response to elevation, I would like to ask if uh, anyone tell you or Dr. Nasir has an experience of giving split course of uh, radiation? No, this was a practice in the past uh, that uh, after giving 45 grade dose of radiation, uh, patient was used to send for cyst cystoscopy. If there was a complete response, then patient was allowed to continue up to 64 gray. Otherwise, if after 46 gray, there was no good response, then this patient was taken out of radiation, then subjected to surgery. But nowadays, even NCCN endorses that we have to first complete the dose, then we uh, evaluate the response. So I also agree with Dr. Nasir comment. This was the practice of past. I have never practiced this one, but now this new adjuvant approach of chemo radiation actually taken over by new adjuvant chemotherapy. So Dr. Ikram and his team have done the great job. So we switch from uh, this approach. So our systematic review and meta-analysis of clinical trials of bladder sparing trimodality treatment for muscle invasive bladder cancer, they have shown uh, that the uh, complete response and salvage cystectomy rates appear to be significantly better in the continuous than the in the split treatment group. So it is preferred to give continuous group. And the subgroup analysis revealed a significant improvement in the five-year overall survival rate of continuous course over split treatment course in later stage tumors. So con um, conventional versus hyperfractionated RT, I think we have, we have the, already yeah. discussed this We point. have already discussed. Yes, yes. Okay. So in this slide, uh, what are the radiation toxicities? So acute side effects, which appear uh, during uh, receiving radiation immediately after up to the uh, three months. So they include dysuria, diarrhea, urgency, frequency, and radiation proctitis. Uh, and chronic side effects include chronic irritative cystitis, hemorrhagic cystitis, bladder contracture, radiation proctitis, rectal stricture and tangentasia, and small bowel obstruction. And in chronic side effects, radiation proctitis usually appear after 12 months in most of the patients. So what are the grades of the proctitis uh, and their management? So this, because this is the most common side effect and most difficult to manage. So uh, if there is acute proctitis, we will uh, stop the RT or alter the radiation therapy regimen. And if there is chronic proctitis, then we will determine the first of all severity of the proctitis, the, the, what is the grade of the proctitis, which includes the pain, ulceration, or is, is there any bleeding, and is it swear moderate, or if there is uncontrollable pain. So, uh, pain. so after uh, grading the proctitis, we will, uh, in grade zero, there is no need to do any intervention and we will continue to reassess the patient. And in grade one to two, uh, we will give anti-inflammatory agents and antioxidants. And if still the signs and symptoms persist, then we will uh, give sucralfate and uh, other agents. 
and we will continue to reassess the patient. Uh, but if there is grade three, then along with the anti-inflammatory uh, agents and antioxidants, uh, we will advise the argon laser ablation uh, if there is any uh, telangiectasias and other uh, signs or symptoms. Uh, but if there is grade four proctitis, then we will proceed with the surgical intervention. Follow up after cystectomy. Um, I would like to ask. Um, like proctitis is not uh, something which we usually so, uh, see in our bladder uh, patients. Like, like proctitis uh, is there in the cervix patients, but in uh, radiating the unibladder patient, we uh, I have not experienced the patient complaining of proctitis. Sir, what is your experience or Dr. Nasir, if you can comment? Abhi, you are asking about uh, proctitis? Yes, sir. But if we plan the patient carefully, then the proctitis uh, incidence is very low. Uh, rather, patient uh, experiences symptoms of cystitis during treatment and after that, but I have never seen the proctitis which needs some interruption and radiation. Uh, I want to share the tolerance doses which we missed. Uh, these are the actually the uh, radiation tolerance doses for 55 grade 20 patients, which we uh, got from various RT trials. Uh, so I want to ask to which uh, RT tolerance doses uh, you use, or is this any specific uh, like paper or something? So for if you ask me, I can comment on that. So I. I totally agree with um, with the comments made by <clears throat> my colleagues that you know we have seen proctitis in long way back when I was a resident in time, but this has changed since the application of IMRT. If rectum is very well prepared and IMRT technique and IGRT use on those bases, proctitis is is not happening at all. Like I haven't seen also in any patient for a long while. The only thing we sometimes we find that uh, the urinary toxicity, but not the proctitis. So for the dose, uh, <clears throat> these are, if you adopt a dose fractionation from one of the studies, uh, then you are fine for that. But these are the, these are the maximum, like your physicist may give you, if you are asking, for example, here that, you know, I want V25 uh, gray to be 80%, they may give you only 50%. So um, uh, there's one way is that you adopt them and they will generate the plan, which will be way better than what you allow the other i use with the time pass that i'm giving more stricter um uh, by more stricter constraint uh, and not evidence based just by for the to give a guide to our physicists so they can do better plan based on which critical structure i'm really worried about like i i am okay with the uh, femoral femoral head uh, doses uh, prescribed given the constraint but I may try to see if I'm seeing the more of the toxicity, for example, of proctitis, I would give them more stricter constraints. So these are, these are the guide, but you can get a better plan. Uh, Sir, them. have you seen any patients who presented in, in follow-up who presented with uh, bleeding per rectum and on clonoscopy, uh, there came to be sigmoid telangiectasia? Yes, yeah, so it's a good question, actually. I would, uh, I would would combine here the bladder and rectal cases. If you look at the shape of the, uh, uh, sorry, bladder and um, and the prostate cases, their shape are pear shaped. And when you grow the margin, that is most important point I learned that inferior, when you give the margin around and posterior margin different for the rectum, but actually superior to inferior margin play a role on the volume on the rectum. So slice by slice, I review my PTV and I modify PTV. And since then I come up with the, suggestion in my CHIRP study I use in prostate as well, that we don't accept anything on rectal, on rectum more than three millimeter, which was the setup error we calculated in our system. So, so based on that, we found that, you know, because soup to inf margin, we, we, we do margin all around and only posterior margin we modify, but we don't modify the margin from superior to inferior, which may bring the volume of PTV on rectum more than one centimeter even in some slices. So therefore I individually um, modify the PTV, individually modify the PTV on the slice to slice basis and not to have rectum uh, more than three to five millimeter on rectum. So that is uh, one of the, for the margin that we can help with. But if the proctitis happen, which happened in past to some of my patients, 
then I was referring them to, uh, to a very interesting gastroenterologist who was treating them in the first stage by only uh, yogurt, organic yogurt. And he mm -hmm. said, this is a phase of late effect. Uh, he was as much radiation oncologist like myself. So he said, this is a late effect of radiation which pass over time. And if we do conservative management, and if we pass through this phase, then there'll be less chance of patient to be treated. So he was doing the uh, blood and hemoglobin level. If RBC and hemoglobin is stable, he was treating them with the, with the yogurt. And if he need to go to next step, then he do the this argon uh, uh, plasma and he don't do all the spot. He do some spot and then observe. And if need to be, then after another time, he do the another set. But that was rarely needed. Most of the patients were conservatively uh, managed. Now, I did a study where I did the scope uh, and uh, and the the the, the uh, rep rectal per uh, bleeding per rectum and when i compared the the risk of uh, proctitis based on endoscope was way higher than what clinically reported so there will be changes and they do leak some blood there which will be not noticed by the patient unless we do the testing but that was clinically insignificant so yes i agree with you that mucosal changes are higher than bleeding per rectum. However, you know that if there's no bleeding per rectum, the clinical impact is is less. So we can just go by the clinical. Dr. Nadeem, is yogurt per oral or per rectal? How, how he yeah, uses this? That's a good question, but he was giving oral. I asked him as well that how the yogurt work, he said these are, these are I think it was a specific type of yogurt, which he was like asking them to find is a, it was organic yogurt was not just the yogurt we buy from the any shop so he was sending them in some of the complementary medicine shop and they were getting it from there and it was helping so he was saying to me it's not only yogurt is actually what i'm trying to do is that i pass their time of the peak effect when the peak peak effect of your radiation will pass through without any major issues of blood hemoglobin level then the patient will actually recover itself. And he figured out, he said to me that this late effect peak is coming somewhere between six months to three, three years, but mostly around one year time for moderately hypofractionated doses. Can I yeah. just say something over here is, uh, is something which is very interesting. And as you know that the, uh, the role of gut uh, flora is gaining a lot of attention now uh, with yes. the advent of the immune checkpoint inhibitors, because uh, we know that uh, uh, there are no evidence, but there are emerging body of data to suggest that patients who get antibiotics or are treated with antibiotics may have less response to immune checkpoint inhibitors. And that is why the, the gut flora has become so very important. And all of these uh, yogurts and different sorts of probiotics are now being increasingly used to see if we can restore the gut flora after uh, treating patients with either uh, uh, broad spectrum antibiotics, radiation, immune checkpoint inhibitors, et cetera, so on and so forth. And this might be a research project, actually. This would be a wonderful research project for somebody to look at the, um, uh, to look at the uh, uh, altered gut flora and how to restore it in response to radiation. Uh, I have a comment uh, here uh, regarding the uh, chances or incidence of practice. This, uh, as I already have mentioned that I never see proctitis in a patient who is getting treatment for bladder cancer. Yes, and But uh, quite often we observe the patient has symptomatic proctitis and sometimes we need it to send to the gastroenterologist for endoscopy and cauterization of the bleeding points. The reason being is that for prostate, we gave 78 gray minimum dose of radiation, while for bladder, it is only 64 gray or 66 gray. So there are a hell of difference between the bladder and prostate uh, doses. So that is the reason why we see uh, the proctitis much more frequently in bladder cancer patients and uh, prostate cancer patients as compared to the bladder cancer. Yes, sir. Definitely. Okay. Thank you, sir. <clears throat> so let's move forward. Uh, what we'll do in the follow-up after cystectomy of the patients, we will uh, do urine cytology and the blood test uh, initially every three months, uh, then every six months in the second year and followed by the annually. 
uh, and imaging of the chest abdomen pelvis is done uh, six monthly in the first two years then it will uh, then it will be done uh, annually in the next uh, three years uh, imaging of the upper urinary tract and monitoring uh, annually for the vitamin b12 deficiency if continent urinary diversion was created it is very important and urethral wash cytology for patients with ila conduit and in patients uh, in which we uh, opted for the bladder preservation approach or partial cystectomy, then it will also include cystoscopy along with the previously mentioned follow-up points. Uh, so cystoscopy is done every three months in the first two years and every six months in the next two years and annually up to year 10, then as clinically indicated. So if there is a recurrent or persistent disease, Local recurrence of muscle invasive disease may be managed with cystectomy, systemic therapy, or palliative PDRBT and best supportive care. A positive cytology with no evidence of disease in the bladder should prompt retrograde selective washings of the upper tract and a biopsy of the prostatic urethra. Recurrences are treated based on the extent of disease at relapse with consideration of prior treatment. This TA or T1 tumors are generally managed with intravesical therapy or cystectomy. If no response is noted following intravesical treatment, a cystectomy is advised. Cystectomy may not be possible in a patient who has undergone a full course of EBRT before or if he or she has a bulky residual disease. For these patients, systemic therapy or palliative PDRBT and best supportive care is advised. I want to highlight one important point is that whenever there is a recurrence, you have to confirm whether it is, it is muscle invasive or not. Because in uh, the recurrences who are not muscle uh, invasive, then again the bladder can be preserved. You are being followed by intravesical therapy, so you have to be very sure the recurrences are muscle invasive or not when to decide for uh, cervix surgery. So, what is your point of view? I, I cannot add more. Actually, this is a very good uh, question. So, um, we have to establish because uh, the treatment is very different for both. So salvage cystectomy and, and also the timing that how much time would you do for first cystoscope after completing the treatment was recommended is minimum at least three months. And we need to observe for a longer period of time because sometimes the impact or effect of complete effect of treatment comes after good few months uh, completion of radiation or concurrent chemo radiation treatment. So I agree with you that first to establish whether local recurrence or not and treat it accordingly. And oh. recurrence, recurrence should be uh, distinguished from the persistence of the disease. And the persistent disease can be muscle invasive or the non-muscle invasive. If there is a non-muscle invasive disease, then we can use intravesical treatment. Or if there is a muscle invasive disease, then chemotherapy versus surgery, we have to decide. Yes, sir. So we need Just to confirm... You know, TRBT also have a role if the if the local recurrence is, is very small. So TRBT and then intravesical treatment. So I agree with all of us, you know, agree on this point. Thank you, sir. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Other non-neurothelial histologies. <clears throat> if there is a small cell histologies, then neurologic or brain imaging is recommended. And CCRT or near joint chemotherapy followed by the local treatment, which includes cystectomy or RT is recommended for any patient with localized disease, regardless of the stage of the patient. Uh, okay, okay, Sadia, um, for small cell bladder cancer, although we may get uh, brain imaging for uh, metastatic workup, but as we do prophylactic cranial radiation for small cell lung cancer, uh, it is there is no data or nobody uses uh, prophylactic cranial radiation for small cell bladder cancers. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. So we don't do yes, we don't do So here I would add something. I would add something. I did a retrospective analysis. I think is the second biggest uh, uh, analysis for small cell cancer, non-extrapulmonary. And it's uh, when we assess that I only found in the GU cases, which was presented in... Uh, uh, in uh, ESCO annual meeting. Uh, so it was only one case among big number of cases where brain metastasis actually appeared in the bladder small cell cancer. And we, in our retrospective analysis from the data we have in Canada that we, we concluded that prophylactic cranial irradiation is not needed in this group of the patient. Thanks oh, for highlighting this very important point. Thank you, sir. 
So in squamous histology, there is no proven role for near joint or adjoint chemotherapy for pure squamous cell carcinoma of the bladder. Uh, local control with surgery or chemotherapy and best supportive care are recommended. For selected patients, combination chemotherapy with paclitaxel, iphosphamide, and cisplatin may be considered. And consider post-operative RT in selective cases uh, in which there is a positive margin surgery. So if the and the doses for small cell bladder cancer are, are also less as compared to be used for other TCCs. So the, it is very interesting that, you know, the small uh, cell bladder cancer, the most important role in our retrospective data was found to be of chemotherapy. So chemotherapy was most important in, in those patients uh, as the small cell cancer anywhere else. And then uh, the radiation doses are very interesting one as, uh, as Dr. Nasir is mentioning. So this will be, uh, we traditionally use up to 50 gray for those cases. But if you look at those escalation trials are coming up as well. So in those dose escalation for small cell lung cancer, we are going back to our previous doses after reducing them. So we would not know then, but uh, but I find that if someone did not receive chemotherapy and have a small cell uh, cancer, extra pulmonary, their outcome was poor. And surgery and radiation have very similar. Uh, in our retrospective analysis, surgery did show uh, some actually uh, more impact in outcome, uh, but that would be questioned because that retrospective analysis I did was from many years back, you know, so it was the techniques and uh, treatment was very different. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I have a question that for squamous cell histologies, uh, I don't think we have any data regarding chemo RT for squamous cell and bladder or do we? You know, I think it's very difficult to uh, to know because the, it's only the any data coming from Egypt, Egypt will be more relevant because they have more uh, cases and they publish different studies. But I I would I understand from all this, it's multidisciplinary have a very important role to discuss, and the maximum treatment we can do is actually beneficial. So if a patient, we need to see about we need to see histology, but also we need to see the locality of the tumor. So how that local tumor is managed in that location, uh, whether different histology. So if you look at bladder cancer, if possible, uh, we we can bring the uh, we can bring the surgery as a uh, treatment option as well because of the locality in in bladder cancer. But uh, it's difficult to say. You know, these are rare tumors, not so much published and not have so many studies. Oh, okay, thank you, sir. So if the histology came out to be pure adenocarcinoma, including the urethral tumors, there is no proven role for near joint or adjoint chemotherapy for, for pure adenocarcinomas of the bladder, including the urethral carcinoma. Local control with surgery or RT and best supportive care are recommended. For urethral carcinoma with localized disease, a partial or complete cystectomy with an unblocked dissection of the urethral ligament with umbilicus and lymph node dissection is recommended. For node positive disease, consider chemotherapy with colorectal regime, which is Colfox or GEM FLP. Consider post chemotherapy surgical consolidation in responding disease. Um, sir, would you like to add some points? I have not seen any case of uh, pure adenocarcinoma, sir. If you or Dr. Nasi have any experience, please share. Uh, yet, I have not seen any adenocarcinoma of the bladder. Rather, I have treated few cases of small cell bladder cancer, as well as uh, uh, lymphoma of the bladder, okay. but not the adenocarcinoma. So same here, I didn't treat any adenocarcinoma. Probably they are dealt by the urologists before they reach to us. So I think I, I have never seen as well. Squamous cell carcinoma I have seen and small cell uh, bladder cancer also. Yes. Oh, thank you so much, sir. So, sir, uh, these are the few questions I would like to ask from you, uh, Dr. Nadeem Pavesab. Uh, how to calculate bowel dose during non-matched CBCT and obstruction level assessment and reversal options for CCRD? Actually, these are the two questions which uh, we could not get any answer. So, please, uh, if you can comment. Okay, so try. I will try, you know, that. So, uh, so first question, we take question one by one. So how to calculate the bowel dose during 
non-match CBCT. So do you want, you are, you mean here that you want to do the cumulative doses to the small bowel? Is that what you're thinking? If Dr. Maria can, uh... Dr. Maria, uh, can you highlight? Yes, sir. yes, sir. So this question was raised by me actually. So uh, okay. yes, uh, you, you are right. I, I would like to know about that, how to uh, uh, know the impact of uh, any non-mesh CBCT on the cumulative OAR dose mm -hmm. of the bowel. Okay, okay, that's that's good. So you know, I can uh, I can tell you my experience about that. So it's it was when we planned the prostate cancer, we don't want to have the bowel dose, small bowel dose, or gynae cancer to go above fifty if possible. We try to keep them maximum fifty four gray, and uh, and we found that is uh, you know relevant to toxicity. But bladder cancer is different. Our target do have many times a small bowel, which can receive up to full dose to the small percentage of the volume. But actually, the I haven't seen any bowel obstruction in those patients where we accepted higher dose to a small portion of bowel, which is close to our target. So the reason is that, that actually I was worried about, as you thinking now, I was worried about when I was resident or I was junior consultant that uh, this may cause obstruction. So I observed their cone beam CT on daily basis. And I found that the bowels are moving. And also, the, even if the bowel is in the field, the, the different portion of their wall come into the field for, for a specific day of the treatment. So it is difficult to have the cumulative dose calculation. Um, I did that in prostate cancer. And uh, it was really very, uh, very extensive work to do. Uh, but now auto contouring coming into play, we can have those cumulative doses. But at the moment, while by doing manually, it is very difficult. So, so we are not uh, we're not calculating cumulative doses at the moment. Um, however, from experience, if the higher uh, small portion of small bowel receiving higher radiation treatment, I confirm them with the CBCT images of subsequent days, next you know few days in the beginning. And if it is not on the same place, then I just ignore uh, to to actually consider that uh, in my future treatments. Yes. So how do you recognize that same bowel loop like uh, bowel is Yes, okay. So, yes. So it is a visual comparison. So if today bowel is suppose in point A uh, position and I visually compare on my cone beam CT because you got cone beam CT as a, as a fused image. So you can uh, use the windows to scroll between those two and you see that whether the bowel is on the same position as on the CT same day. And actually... I never found that it's on the same position unless someone have pelvic surgery where they have trapped bowels. In those cases, if it is not close to GTV, that portion of small bowel, then I compromise the doses of the bladder in that specific area where the small bowel is trapped or fixed or non-mobile. Non so I can accept then in those cases up to 55 gray maximum to that portion of a small bowel. But in, the, in, in most cases, except one case where I face that challenge. Um, in most cases, bowel is never on the same position and they are mobile and I accepted higher doses. Even, even because of peristalsis, it moves during a particular fraction. So exactly. bowel Correct. dose changes every, every moment during that treatment even. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, Dr. Maria, what about the next question? Actually, I could not understand it. Obstruction level assessment and the vertical option. Uh, so, uh, meaning kya hai? obstruction level assessment and reversal options for CCRT. <laughs> Actually, actually, the the case uh, we were discussing it was about a patient who presented with obstruction. Okay. Immature and obstruction. Okay. Obstruction okay. of what? Urinary obstruction. Yes, and the, the patient who presented with hematuria and uh, obstructive symptoms. And oh. that were that that the urologist you report will tell you that. I think urologist report of cystoscopy will tell you the level of obstruction where the there is obstruction in the urinary tract. Oh, actually, actually, actually Dr. Maria has been kind enough to uh, help us in uh, collecting the learning objective. So this was one of the, and so we, 
Okay. So we didn't understand these objectives, so we thought we will discuss with the rest of the seniors. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for the <clears throat> information and your valuable input. So we would like to conclude our presentation. And I have a I have a comment here. Uh, I Most missed. I missed a few moments of the initial part of this session. Uh, while selecting for the, the patients for uh, bladder preservation approach, we should take a detailed history of the patient. If patient has a already very small capacity of the bladder, then actually that patient is not a very ideal candidate for uh, concurrent chemo radiation or bladder preservation approach. So if we offer the treatment to such a patient, what will happen? Bladder will get fibrosed and its capacity will further reduce. So in literature, we patient will have to urinate after every few minutes. So in literature, it is termed as that those patients become bladder cripple. Means instead of if this patient was subjected to uh, surgery and earlier conduit was made or some uh, bag was used. So in that case scenario, the quality of life of patient will be much better as compared to those, that patient whose bladder was preserved and he has to urinate after every 10 to 15 minutes. So these patients are not ideal candidates for bladder preservation approach. Rather, these patients should be consulted and they should be considered for surgery and either conduit formation or some uh, stroma formation. All right, sir. Thank you so much, much. Sir. I would, I would uh, like to thank today's presenters, Dr. Aisha Iqbal from Inmol and Dr. Sadia Sadiq. Thank you so much for uh, preparing. Just, uh, a very, so very, very quick and brief comment. Yes. Uh, I mean, the way uh, the Kipro uh, sessions are improving every time. This was the sixth one. Uh, that is giving us promises that inshallah, uh, we will be taking it further. And I congratulate all of you who attended today, participated very actively. But the way you have structured it was really remarkable. You know, getting it into more comprehensive way so that everybody gets the answer. A lot of learning for me as well today. So thank you very much to all thank of you. Thank you, sir. Thanks a lot, sir. I would like to thank uh, thanks a lot, Dr. Maria, for uh, giving us giving the opportunity, us this platform, this CIPRO platform, the opportunity for discussing this very important topic. All of the colleagues, the seniors that are present here to guide us, Dr. Mneem Parvez, Dr. Nasi, Dr. Abbasi. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. Dr. Ikram, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Dr. Aisha, for, for regarding my efforts. But uh, to be very honest, I was so glad that Aisha actually came forward and volunteered to do that because I was doing it all alone for the past uh, six to seven months. And uh, I'm so happy that I have an uh, equal partner on board now. So thank you so much, Dr. Aisha. And uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sadia, for always uh, catering to my request. Uh, and especially Dr. Nadeem Parvez, who, <laughs> who agreed to um, join as as an expert for whole two hours or maybe even more than that so yeah. sir your expert opinions were uh, you know they were like the the value of today's discussion and thank you so much to dr ikram as well uh, for um, chipping in with all the chemotherapy um, 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 comments uh, they were also um, very remarkable uh, to just to mention we had some medical oncology residents connected today as well in the initial part of the session. So I hope and they must have benefited from Dr. Ikram's discussion as well. Uh, there are some uh, comments in the um, chat box, although there, there are no such questions. Uh, some Is comments by Dr. Basi for Dr. Ikram. And uh, so, and uh, and um, by Dr. Hamad, that uh, excellent session and congratulations to Kipro and in, in Mole. So basically we are all one and conducting these sessions and i am um, taking some break for ramzan i i do not plan to conduct a session during ramzan so perhaps uh, after ramzan we'll be conducting some other session which i have not thank yet you. scheduled thank, thank you, you everyone. Uh, we are pleased to do this inshallah we will do these uh, such uh, meetings again inshallah so inshallah, thank you so inshallah. Much. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadeem Parvez. Thank you so much, Dr. Abbasi, Dr. Ikram. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Javeria, for recording. You may not stop the recording. Thank you.